Well, I'm Johan Hannes, so I'm a medical doctor from Brussels, uh, Belgium, and I am director of the European Lifestyle Medicine Certificate, a member of the board of the European Lifestyle Medicine Organization, so ELMO. Um, I am also welcoming here the, the moderator, so the president of the European Lifestyle Medicine Organization, Dr. Stefania Ubaldi. Um, she will be in charge about uh, moderating the chapter of uh, sexual health uh, and uh, in lifestyle medicine. Then the moderator uh, of the chapter of nutrition and physical activity in lifestyle medicine today is uh, Dr. Ioannis Arcadianos. So he's the vice president of uh, European Lifestyle Medicine Organization. He's based in Athens in Greece. Then we have uh, the moderator of the chapter um, uh, Lifestyle Medicine uh, for Children and Families. So it's really something very specific for the European lifestyle uh, medicine. So it's Professor Dr. Urania Kolokotroni from uh, Cyprus. And then again from Belgium, we have the moderator of the chapter uh, Cardiology Lifestyle Medicine. And uh, I'm talking about Professor Dr. Carlos van Migan. So um, these are the moderators, welcome. And of course, we have uh, a lot of, um, of personalities, experts in their field and who've been uh, just linked with lifestyle medicine recently. And the moderators of, the, uh, of each chapter will introduce them. So thank you very much for being here and I hope that uh, we all will enjoy this, uh, this session. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you for your hard work to do this happen. It was a common work. So that uh, what I tried to um, uh, to say also. Thank you for everybody in a, such a short time that we 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 did this uh, for the first time at the European level. This type of uh, activity. So it's your the microphone, uh, Yanis. Good morning to all. Thank you for being with us. Uh, I will be the moderator of the chapter of nutrition and lifestyle activity, physical activity in lifestyle medicine. As we know, nutrition and exercise play an important role in the management of the no communicable disease related to lifestyle as obesity. Our discussions will focus on the new data about these two chapters, nutrition and lifestyle activity and we'll try to find out what, what are the best ways for the health professionals to use them in their practice. I'll start the chapter with my presentation and then we'll follow the others and I present to you one by one. So I will share my screen. I hope that you can see. Uh, yes. Okay. Is it okay, Ian? Yes. We see everything. Thank you for so much. Okay. So my topic will be obesity lifestyle medicine, a field that I'm practicing the last 27 years. I hope that all agree that obesity is a lifestyle related disease in the majority of cases. Obesity is a medical condition described as excess body weight in the form of fat. When accumulated, this fat can lead to severe health impairments. Obesity is a disease. <laughs> E6C in ICD-10. In May 2017, the World Obesity Federation released a position statement in the journal Obesity Reviews recognizes obesity as a chronic, relapsing, progressive disease process. For adult obesity, a BMI greater than or equal to 30, BMI is a person's weight in kilograms divided by his or her height in meters square. It's important to recognize that BMI itself is not measuring health or a psychological state, such as resting blood pressure, that indicates the presence or absence of disease. It's simply a measure of patient's size. The stage is of obesity is class one, low risk, class two, moderate risk, 
and the severe obesity class three with BMI over 40. The prevalence of obesity on the world is worse in the last 20 years, as you can see in the world obesity map, and the color became deeper in almost all continents, including Europe. That means that the problem is increasing. In this diagram published in Lassen, you can see that the obesity rates almost tripled the last 40 years in both men and women. What happened all these years? We changed our lifestyle. Due to all the above statistics, the epidemic of obesity is now recognized as one of the most important public health problems facing the world today. We are what we eat. And of course, our habits and our lifestyle pay, plays an important role. But if we change our lifestyle, we can prevent it. Factors affecting body weight according to Harvard School of Public Health. It's genes, although the effect is relatively small and heredity is not a density. Influence on prenatal and early life. Poor quality and unhealthy diets. Excessive sitting life TV and screen time. Very little physical activity and sleep. And toxic environment, food and physical activity. The pathological cause includes genetic, hormonal disorders like hypothyroidism, insulinoma, lack of growth hormone, and medicines. Some of them are insulin, steroids, and others. But the percentage of these obese patients having such a pathological underlying cause is very little. Obesity is almost everywhere. It causes many medical conditions in the whole body, including coronary heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, cancer, gynecological abnormalities, stroke. This light is characteristic and shows the severity of the disease. In our days, in a pandemic of COVID-19, according to all research until now, obesity is a major risk. This is a relevant recent publication in Obesity Reviews in August 66, 26, three months ago. Full analysis show individuals with obesity were more at risk for COVID-19 positive higher than 46%, for hospitalization 113% higher, or ICU admission 74% higher. And finally, for mortality, 48% increase in deaths. The, mechanis the mechanis mechanism behind, uh, behind it includes metabolic dis dysfunction, immune impairments, and adipose inflammation. And of course, important role plays comorbidities as cardiovascular disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, hyperinsulinemia, and also liver and kidney disease. Let's see how we approach a patient having obesity. It will be in first visit in doctor practice. It's very important to spend enough time with obese patients, especially in the first visit. Must get a medical history. Asking for eating and lifestyle habits, including exercise, sleep, alcohol, smoking. Also to access the psychological state, stress and depression, to determine the BMI with measurement of body weight and height, to measure the body fat, measure the waist circumference, and also to plan a list of exams, including blood exams and ultrasound if needed. One very important matter we must have in our mind facing an obese patient is that must first investigate the reasons behind them and then decide what to do and how to retreat. And very important is the patient's frequent follow-up. Don't forget that obesity is a chronic, relapsing, progressive disease process. Let's see the life intervention for prevention and treatment of the obesity. It's nutrition, physical activity, limit screen time, 
stress management, social habits, and finally environment. Nutrition is an intake of food considered in relation to the body's dietary needs. Good nutrition and an adequate well-balanced diet combined with regular physical activity is a cornerstone of good health. There are a lot of nutrition models for obesity management. Must choose the one that is easy for the patient to follow long term according to his or her lifestyle. I will shortly present three models that I think that are easy for patients to follow. As I say to my patients, the point is to lose weight the way they live, and that is valid especially for the nutrition model they are going to follow. Mediterranean diet water from US News between 35 diet models as the best diet for 2020, which scored 4.2 to 5, with partial rating for 4.8 to 5 in the category healthy diet. Planetary health diet. Maybe you have heard about it, that it was presented last year from a group of very significant scientists. First name is Professor Wald Willett from Harvard University. The diet, the diet has been developed that promises to save lives, feed 10 billion people, and, with, uh, and all without causing catastrophic damage to the planet. If you see, the proposed model contains a lot of fruits, vegetables, home grains, but also dairy products, fish and powdery, and few red meats, and it's very close to Mediterranean diet project. Harvard University proposed a simpler model, the healthy eating plate for adults and kids. Physical activity. Keeping active can help people stay at a healthy weight or lose weight. It can also lower the risk of heart disease, diabetes, stroke, high blood pressure, osteoporosis, and sudden cancers, as well as reduce stress and boost mood. In Greece, lifestyles inactive, sorry, lifestyles do just the opposite. Every little change are good enough. Just choose to take the stairs instead of the elevator whenever you can. Screen time. Screen time plays years per year a significant role in obesity management and includes TV, computer, laptop, and PCs, tablets, smartphones, and computer games. Excessive research has confirmed the link between TV viewing and obesity in children and adults in countries around the world. Computer, video game, and internet are, are used are associated with excess weight. Stress management, including sleep. Stress hormones it releases and the effects on high fat sugar it comes from foods push people to work overeating. This is mounting evidence that people who get too little sleep have a higher risk of weight gain and obesity than people who get seven to eight hours of sleep at night. The hormones associated with weight gain obesity is serotonin, cortisol, and neuropeptide Y. Social habit, alcohol. Alcohol abuse can certainly lead to obesity. A heavy drinker may be consuming an extra 1,000 to 3,000 calories per day on top of their diet. They are also likely to be engaged in a lifestyle that does not involve a great deal of physical activity. And alcohol has seven calories per gram, don't forget it. Environment. It's a family, work sites and active, active commuting to work, schools and active commuting to school, neighborhoods, access to public transportation, bike and pedestrian friendly streets designs and policies. Environment and obesity. We have the food environment, what type of food is available, how much it costs, how it is the market influenced what people eat. The built environment, buildings, neighborhoods, transportation system and other human made elements on the landscape influence how active people are. And the new technology, of course, cars, computers, televisions, labor saving devices, and so on, change what people do for work, transportation, and leisure. Major role play the globalization in terms of trade that gives easy access to cheap food, 
a rapidly evolving technology that limits physical activity, income and socioeconomic status that affects lifestyle, and urbanization that affects diet and physical activity exercise. Obesity is a lifestyle-related disease in the vast majority. Influence the health status in multiple levels and in a lot of systems. Must take actions. Health professionals must target basically to prevent and of course to treat obesity by evidence-based lifestyle interventions. If necessary, must use medicine and or bariatric surgical methods. And a very important one, must focus so that to act in young ages, children and teens, and one simple way to change their lifestyle focuses mainly in healthier nutrition habits and more physical activity. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Stefan, uh, Ioannis. Yes. So I think that it was useful just to give a message that obesity is a major lifestyle related disease and, and has uh, but uh, and uh, reflects but in the other uh, disease. So uh, let's go on with uh, the next uh, uh, speaker. It's Dr. Rekha Vernes, family, sports and lifestyle medical physician, country representative of Hungary, of Elmo. And the topic of her speech will be exercise prescription for chronic conditions, COVID-19 and sports. Rekha, please be on time on your 15 minutes and we can start your presentation. Thank you, Yanis, for the invitation and the introduction. Let me just try to share my presentation with you. Can you see it now? Yes, put it. Okay. 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 Very good. Very good. I just tried to condense some, some thought about exercise prescription for chronic, chronic conditions and some new thoughts about the COVID-19 and sports. So uh, it seems that physical inactivity and sedentary behavior is a major contributor uh, for the risk leading to death uh, uh, besides other medical conditions. And even those conditions can be strongly influenced with physical activities like high blood pressure, obesity, even high cholesterol. Uh, low cardiorespiratory fitness uh, is a major attributable fracture of all cause deaths, which is only con comparable to high blood pressure in men. In this study of uh, diabetic uh, men, the risk of cardiovascular mortality uh, related to physical fitness was unrelated to BMI and weight. So obese men uh, who were moderately fit and had less than half the risk of the dying than normal weight men who were unfit. So can I just go ahead? Okay. So, uh, but not only the, uh, the lack of physical uh, activity not only contributes to uh, cardiovascular disease, but also for mental health like depression and the cognitive functions like dementia and also metabolic diseases like type 2 diabetes and different kinds of cancers, mainly breast cancer and colon cancer. But the good news is that physical inactivity and sedentary behavior is a curable condition with the good prognosis. So as the way we learn in the med school how to prescribe different medications and treatments should be the way how we learn to prescribe exercise. And the way the framework for this uh, is the FITTVP uh, framework, where the frequency is the how often, the intensity is how hard, the type of exercise is the what kind of exercise, and the time is for how long. The volume stands for what is the total amount of the recommended exercise, and then the progression means that how the program should advance. So let's say this is like the framework for aerobic exercises for healthy individuals, and when we and we can we apply usually this framework for patients with the chronic conditions and adjust 
uh, four day conditions and uh, the other parameters. So if for the aerobic exercise, the frequency should be five days per week of moderate or three days per week of vigorous exercise or the combination of these two. The intensity should be moderate or vigorous and light only for those who are deconditioned. Uh, the time of the exercise should be the total of at least 150 minutes per week of moderate or 75 minutes per week of vigorous exercise, but even bouts of 10 minutes of exercise over the days are beneficial. The type of the aerobic exercises are the ones which moves large muscle groups on a continuous and rhythmic fashion. And the total volume per week of the exercise should be about 500 and a thousand mats min per week, which is about 1,000 calorie, kilocalorie per week. Sadly, this is only a few bites of chocolate. And that stands for 150 minutes per week of exercise. And it, it comes about like a 6,000 uh, steps per day. And the progression should be starting low and going slow in progression. The FITT protocol for resistance or muscle exercise would be the frequency should be about three times per week, like every other day. And you can use different muscle groups for exercises for muscle fitness. And the intensity should be about like 10 different kind of exercises of three sets and about 10 uh, repetitions of uh, 70 to 90 percent of maximal effort. And the tie depends on basically uh, on for how many of minutes you can do go through these exercises and increasing the muscle, uh, the uh, progressive overload is the, the main um, uh, thing as, as you need to follow to uh, increase your muscle mass. And the type of uh, exercises for the resistance training can be your own body weight training or resistant band exercises can be free weights or machines. But before we uh, uh, recommend exercise for patients with uh, chronic conditions, then, then we need to decide who need a medical clearance prior to start exercising. And with this, our goal is to reduce the exercise-related cardiovascular events and avoiding uh, uh, um, complications of cardiovascular systems like southern cardiac deaths or AMI in inactive individual, individuals. Our goal also is to reduce the musculoskeletal injury. But usually the risk of death is very rare uh, in exercise and usually are in individuals with the known cardiovascular metabolic or renal disease and in sedentary individuals who increase their intensity of exercise suddenly. But meanwhile, when we want no unnecessary risk, we also don't want unnecessary barriers to exercise. I would refer here to the American College of Sports Medicine's guidelines for exercise testing and prescriptions. And based on these new guidelines, this device or specifies patients uh, who need medical clearance based basically on these four different measures uh, are the current level of activity. If the patient has known cardiovascular, metabolic or renal disease, is the patient has any size on symptoms of these diseases and what would be the desired level of intensity. In this case, the regular exercise is a planned structures physical activity of at least 30 minutes of at least three days per week for at least three months. So based on this, you can decide which patients need a a medical evaluation before starting exercising. Exercise is essential in the treatment of diabetes, and it's not only through the circulatory system, but also other major systems which involved in the diabetes, mainly the muscle, the adipose, the liver, and the pancreas. So when uh, aerobic, aerobic, aerobic exercise seems to contribute mostly for the cardiorespiratory fitness, the resistant exercise contributes to the metabolic side and benefits of exercise. Muscle contraction increases the number of insulin receptors and GLUT4 transporters, and these help to get the glucose into the muscle cells and the other cells, so with this decreasing the glucose level in the bloodstream. But the glucose for, uh, increases glucose uptake independent of insulin, and that's where uh, exercise helps to lower the 
the blood glucose. Uh, even for two to three days after exercise, the insulin sensitivity is increased. So that's why we say that you should do exercise, uh, resistant exercise every other day or don't go without exercising over two to three days. But also increases the number of mitochondria in the muscle cells and, uh, oxi and with this increases the oxidation of fatty acids. Also, the metabolic rate of a skeletal muscles is a hundred times of, on activation than in rest. Uh, so for patients with uh, diabetes, we are prescribing exercise, then we need to keep uh, in, uh, in mind special considerations. This is mainly the hypoglycemia, which can last up to 12 hours. And therefore, uh, exercising patients with diabetes needs frequent monitoring of glucose le level, ideally with the continuous glucose monitoring. The contraindications would be uncontrolled hypertension and severe diabetic retinopathy. And we also need to consider uh, the uh, um, peripheral and the autonome neuropathy in diabetic patients. So these are the modalities of lifestyle uh, for the treatment of hypertension with or without medications. And I would just uh, raise attention of, from these of the, on the physical activity. So aerobic exercises uh, can decrease blood pressure in hypertensive patients uh, ab around five to eight millimeters of mercury, and only resistant uh, exercise alone can decrease uh, on some degree of the blood pressure in hypertensive patients. So as we do, like for example, in the bacterial infection and we prescribe patients antibiotics, the same thing should apply when we uh, prescribe exercise for patients, like for instance, in high blood pressure. So this needs to be an adequate amount of exercise and we need to apply it for an adequate time. That means that exercise to be effect effective in the treatment of high blood pressure should last over months and usually we see the effect over four to six months. The progression should be gradual and usually the aerobic exercise of moderate intensity is the, is the most effective in treating high blood pressure patients but also resistant exercise is, is useful. The contraindication would be uncontrolled hypertension and the Valsalva maneuver doing the resistant exercise, therefore, this because this can increase significantly their blood pressure. Recently, we see many patients with COVID 19 uh, infections and we have many questions about how they can exercise. We mostly have data from athletes, uh, and besides the pulmonary uh, involvement of the uh, COVID-19 infection with the uh, uh, pneumonia, the viral pneumonia and the acute respiratory dist distress. The other concern is uh, the through the direct viral infections or the cytokine response is the cardiac involvement of COVID-19 patients. And this can lead to inflammatory myocarditis and myocarditis can lead to myocardial scaring, arrhythmia and heart failure. The problem with the myocarditis is that this can go silent, so patient has no any signs or symptoms of the myocarditis. Only we can detect the myocarditis through myomarkers like troponin or BNP. There is this study which showed that even patients with the normal cardiac ultrasound and troponin level, 50% of them had myocardial inflammation on the cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. And those who are asymptomatic or have a mild symptom seems to have less cardiac involvement. So the question is, does exercise help in the prevention of COVID-19? We mostly have data from previous upper respiratory and viral infections and seems that through the immune system, sedentary behavior and strenuous exercise decreases or weakens the immune system but moderate intensity exercise seems to protect it against upper respiratory viral infections through different actions. Also from studies we see now that the respiratory muscle uh, weakened by, and the thoracic, thoracic muscle weakness and the diaphragm during ventilation is, can be a significant cause that the patients cannot be weaned from the ventilation. 
and it seems that endurance trained individuals seems to be protected from the ventilation induced diaphragm, diaphragm uh, dysfunction. Also, the complications of the COVID-19 infections can be from the sarcopenia of the thoracic muscles in older individuals. How to return to exercise after COVID-19 infection? So, patients should be completely symptoms-free before returning to exercise. With, for those who have no or mild symptoms, should not exercise for two weeks. The ones who had mild or severe symptoms should not uh, exercise at least for two weeks and might need additional testing. And in case of myocarditis, then the myocarditis protocol is effective and maybe rehabilitation for three to six months. And even returning to sports activities should be gradual and with the constant monitoring for the cardiovascular system and starting increasing exercise with pulse control. The, uh, the signs should be, uh, which should be uh, followed or raise awareness would be palpitation, chest pain, uh, exercise intolerance, dyspnea, or dizziness. Two minutes, Sirica, two minutes. Okay, here I would just refer to this um, algorithm which came uh, out in the JAMA cardiology uh, in May this year. And here is a stepwise approach, how to uh, treat um, and what to do with COVID-19 infected patients. Nutritional status can be uh, important, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Yanis, uh, for uh, COVID-19 infected patients. And these are just some vitamins uh, which can be correlated with the um, uh, susceptibility or the course of the infection. Vitamin D seems very strongly correlated with this, but some evidence are from uh, about selenium, zinc, and vitamin C but we need to uh, increase the awareness that these are just adjuvants. So the basic measurements would be the mask wearing, keeping the social distance and hand washing. So what we can rec recommend for patients are do not exercise even with my syndrome and stay home, use your own equipments, wear masks and keep distance. And the sports seems to be safe during COVID are outdoor sports like Nordic walking, running, biking, kayaking and home based exercising. Can you wear masks during exercise? It seems that you can. It doesn't affect vigorous exercise in healthy individuals, but you need to wear those because sometimes the stream of infected aerosols can be 20 meters from the infected individuals. But otherwise we need to keep in mind that there might be another wave following the COVID-19 pandemic and that could be the consequences of lifestyle and inactivity. But anyway, try to stay healthy and exercise during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Rekha. You were on time, so thank you very much. Let's go to the next speaker, Anna Hortzev, nutritionist, master coach and health fitness lifestyle advisor, founder of Nutri Health Coaching, Lifestyle Medicine, and Anna's Healthy Kitchen, Culinary Medicine. And the, the topic of uh, her speech will be the path to change the balanced way of living. Anna, you have, you can share your screen. Hello to everyone. Thank you. Can you all see my screen? Yes, it's okay, you can go on. Yeah. So I will talk about the, the path to change uh, for a healthy living between education and practice. Sorry. Go down. Okay. So my path began uh, seven years ago. I was diagnosed with a serious disease and uh, I had two ways to choose and I decided to have uh, a healthier lifestyle. And um, that took me to discover my new mission in life, that is help the others to change to a healthy lifestyle as I did. So my first focus was nutrition. I decided to learn more about it and uh, about the healing power of food. But soon I realized that I needed more tools in order to, to help the others in the process of change. So I decided to study coaching and I specialized in confidence coaching and positive psychology. Oh, sorry. 
what is happening here no it's okay Uh, and the more I studied nutrition, the more I was getting aware of the relevance of the other pillars like physical activity, sleep or mental well-being. So I decided to learn more about lifestyle medicine and I structured my practice with evidence-based approach in these different pillars. So my therapeutic plans always include recommendation in all these areas. I started to collaborate with different specialists as a teamwork, referring my patients to them according to the patient needs. So for example, with obesity, uh, with obese patients, it's very important, I, uh, I discovered that it's very important to work in these different areas. Uh, and in fact, is uh, the only approach that I believe in, and uh, especially when we are talking about non-communicable diseases. So I identified my mission and the question now was how? How can I help the others to change to a better, a better and a healthier lifestyle? So I created two big projects, the Nutri Health Coaching Project, that is a, a teamwork a lifestyle medicine project, and the Diana's Healthy Kitchen, that is a culinary medicine project. So how, how do I communicate with my patients? I communicate with my patients in person uh, through normal consultations, uh, resulting in a therapeutic plan. Through practical consultations, for example, at the supermarket, I help them to, to read the labels and to do better choices. And also through culinary medicine sessions at my kitchen, uh, where I cook with my patients in, in, the, in my practice. I also communicate virtually and uh, with this pandemic situation, this kind of communication is becoming more and more important. Uh, I have a site with a blog and a podcast and uh, uh, every month I talk about a different subject in collaboration with other professionals from the different uh, lifestyle pillars. I created also a YouTube channel where uh, I share mostly my recipes and um, uh, for example uh, in May during the quarantine I did a webinar uh, to talk about how important it was to catch this opportunity of, uh, of this pandemic to, to stop and do a restart to our lifestyles. So I identified how I decided to identify who, uh, who I'm going to focus my attention on. So different contexts, different needs. Uh, I created one-to-one -one consultations based on coaching fundamentals. Uh, corporate context, as I have uh, almost 15 years of working with companies in my background uh, before I decided to change my, my career, I knew the, the relevance of the corporate context in what refers to change the employee's lifestyle. So I decided to create programs directed to the corporate context where I do workshops, lectures and consultations. Kids, another context with different needs. So uh, with kids, my mission is to give them information in a funny way. I teach them about the lifestyle pillars, always adapting to their context. And then we do an activity with fruits and vegetables, uh, quizzes, and also some kind of, uh, of game uh, to include the importance of physical activity. So this is how I structured my practice until now. And uh, uh, there are some key findings that I would like to share with you. So the first is listening. Uh, patients need to feel that you are really listening. And, um, I learned that there are two kinds of listening. You can listen to answer. You are listening, but you are thinking in what you are going to answer. So you are not uh, active listening. Uh, and you can listen to learn. You listen to learn your patient history. And then you formulate your answer, or better if you formulate a question. So there, are, there is a big difference between the two. Always explain, your patient uh, wants to know why and how, and the more you explain your recommendations, the more chances you get that your patient will implement them. So it's very important. Identify, uh, get to know what is your patient motivation. Uh, for me, it's the key for every process of change. 
find the, the patient motivation. Uh, finding the correct motivation can determine if your patient is committed and focused. And it should be present in every consultation to keep the focus on. Always work as a team to achieve patient goals. The goal is the patient goal, but to work to achieve it should be a teamwork. Demonstrate and show your patient how to get there. And uh, here is walk the talk and give the example and also demonstrate your patient how to get to their goals. Uh, your patient will need to know that you are there, so you, you inform, you demonstrate and show, and then you let it go, but you do a proper follow-up. So, to finish, and I, I, I think that I'm on time, uh, I would like to finish with a statement that describes my, my path, my practice until now, that is, sometimes I inspire my patients, and uh, in my case, I, I know that is true because I have a... Uh, a life history that I know that can be inspiring, uh, but more often they inspire me because uh, it's all about learning with our experience and our patients and adapt our practice to what we think that can be useful and helpful uh, to achieve the patient goals. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. You were on time and less time so we have more time for the next time for the discussion thank you very much for your presentation it was very very useful i think regarding the the area you are uh, practicing so our next uh, speaker is Vosik Masik Malcik. Uh, it's a medical doctor a consultant in gastroenterology and researcher at at Pomeranian Medical University and the Center of Digestive Disease and Clinica in Szczecin, Poland, if I pronounce well. His area of interest revolves around the microbiome, probiotics, and gastrointestinal disease for better health and well being. Uh, the topic of his speech is Human Microbiome in 2020 The Road Ahead for Health and Well Being Interventions. Posik. You have yes. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> good morning. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, if you make it bigger. Yes, yes, yes. I'm just trying. Okay. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to see you all, um, and welcome at your screens. I would like to share some information about what's going on in the microbiome in 2020, because this is a crucial um, organ. These are my disclosures. Um, and if you see um, at the microbiota, we have to say that any stress, and stress can be physical, psychological, um, it could be diet, it could be lack of physical exercise or uh, too much of physical exercise, can lead to microbiota alterations. And these microbiota alterations can impair the gut barrier um, and this can trigger lots of pro-inflammatory um, events leading to systemic uh, reaction. So the question is, what is healthy gut microbiome? And this is a long going debate. There are many papers on this, but in general, we can say that the microbiome, which, is, which has the high diversity, which is very diverse, it's resilient, resistance to stress, and possess high functionality. So this is a picture of a healthy colon at colonoscopy. And this we can say it's a healthy microbiome in general, of course. And the microbiome of low diversity, it's uh, very, uh, uh, can contain pathobionts like Clostridium. And this is a picture of Clostridium difficile infection. So it's definitely a person with low diversity microbiome. And sometimes we call it dysbiosis. Uh, but the, the, a part of definition, we can ask whether we can influence and modulate gut microbiota, not really going into the definition what is healthy, what is unhealthy. And we can influence the microbiome by lifestyle changes, so by various dietary interventions and calorie restrictions, for example. It's a powerful intervention modulating microbiota. Physical activity, of course, and the other lifestyle medicine interventions. Uh, either psychological or physiological. And of course, we can also use pharma and non-pharma therapies like prebiotics, probiotics, symbiotics, 
Uh, psychobiotics, fecal microbiota transplantation, which is a powerful to modulate microbiota. We can use variety of antibiotics and new so-called non-absorbable antibiotics. And of course, we can influence the microbiome also by medicines. And we have some proofs already published in the literature. And for example, a big study in India where more than 7,000 pregnant women were enrolled giving birth to newborns and those newborns, uh, there were more than 4,000 newborns, were getting probiotic or symbiotic, which is a prebiotic and probiotic for seven days in their first month of life. And the, the researchers observed 40% reduction of sepsis and reduction of upper respiratory tract infection. This is a powerful intervention because sepsis is a major cause of death in countries like India. So when we talk about the reduction of sepsis and reduction of um, upper respiratory tract in infections, we have to point out to gut lung microbiome axis. And I think this is very relevant in the context of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID. We have to be aware that the gut is linked to the lung and the gut can be the source of various metabolites. And also the gut is the place where lots of uh, immune cells are uh, maturing and traveling to the lungs. So impaired maturation of these immune cells and increased load of metabolites in the lung can lead to systemic inflammation and cytokine storm in COVID-19 infection. So by influencing the gut microbiota by variety of interventions, we can also um, influence the outcome of the disease like COVID. And for example, there is a very good data uh, implicating the role of inflammasomes. These inflammasomes can be um, triggered, for example, by spike protein in SARS-CoV-2 infection. And we know that the microbiota and certain drugs, possibly through microbiota, can also affect the activity of this inflammasome and can either lead to cytokine storm or could lead to the healing. We also have other proofs like fecal microbiota transplantation, and we know that this uh, intervention is very effective in Clostridium difficile infection treatment, but also more recent studies showing that, for example, FMT is slowing the progression of type 1 diabetes, which is really a nice study published in GUT this year. We have also other proofs, like uh, this is one of our recent systematic and review and meta analyses published this year showing that prebiotics and probiotics influence in positive way cardiometabolic risk factors in healthy people. Also, when we um, supplement dietary fiber in uh, bigger amounts to patients with type 2 diabetes through modulation of gut microbiota and gut barrier, we can uh, positively influence the gly gly patient's glycemia. And also another proof showing that if we modulate microbiota in this means by probiotics before the surgery, especially major abdominal surgeries or transplantation like liver transplantation, we can um, minimize the risk of surgery related infections even up to three months after surgery. This is really spectacular. And also we see that nowadays, at least for, for digestive tract disorders, Microbiota alterations somehow are implicated in majority of conditions. And also, uh, it's a possible link between uh, psychological aspects and those diseases. We have to be aware that almost 50% of chronic GI disorders are linked to depression or anxiety. And that's why we talk today about psychobiome, and there are new concepts like psychobiotics, which are novel probiotics, which can influence the gut-brain axis and minimize the, uh, the effect of stress in various chronic conditions. And for example, we have also new guidelines like American Gastroenterological Association guidelines on probiotics. This is very interesting because such a big organization for years has been neglecting the uh, role of probiotics, but this year, they issued the guidelines and they say that probiotics might be effective in the prophylaxis of Clostridium difficile if the patient is on antibiotics and prevent um, uh, necro necrotizing enterocolitis in newborns and can prevent inflammation in J-pouch surgery.
and this is a positive recommendation. The AGA gives negative recommendations to use probiotics in infectious gastroenteritis and gives no recommendation, but just because of knowledge gap, to use probiotics in ulcerative colitis, in the treatment of C. difficile, in the treatment of Crohn's disease, and in the treatment of irritable bowel syndrome. But this is somehow controversial as for irritable bowel syndrome, because we know that there are recommendations like this one from 2017 by the World Gastroenterology Organization and American College of Gastroenterology when they recommend to use those uh, probiotics in selected patients in IBS. And also we can think outside the box, maybe it's not the, the matter if we shall give the probiotics, but for how long, and there are studies, this is a very nice study from Poland, showing that if we uh, supplement probiotics to patients at risk and transplantology wards, we can, uh, for a longer time, for example, one year constant, all patients are getting probiotics. Uh, during this one year, the number of C. difficile positive patients drastically drop down. And when, when, we, when we abandon this intervention, the C. diff infections rise again. And there are also very good proofs that microbiota modulation is influencing NASH, non-alcoholic statohepatitis, which is more and more frequent nowadays. And we know that there are some gut barrier abnormalities in the pathogenesis of this. And by using the dietary interventions with polyphenols, prebiotics, and of course exercise, we can postpone the negative outcomes of this disease. And also there are proofs that microbiome alterations are present in liver cirrhosis and modulating microbiota in these patients can also have positive effect. We also know that certain drugs like proton pump inhibitors can influence microbiome and can increase the risk of infection. We know that many other drugs like statins or metformin can influence microbiome and these drugs should always be taken into consideration when planning the um, you know, randomized clinical trials uh, looking at microbiota. And we also have to take into account nutrition. This is a very nice study from last year showing that if we uh, consume a large amounts of salts, uh, sodium salt, this can have a negative effect on uh, microbiota and can stimulate the uh, release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Certain uh, bacterial species can have a preventive effect on this. But just looking at it, we have to be aware that we have to take a lots of factors like age, sex, BMI, bowel movements, dietary frequency, alcohol, and this is probably different in different disorders to um, um, have a good microbiome analysis. And this is very difficult and requires very advanced uh, biostatic, bio, bioinformatical uh, uh, analysis. And also we talked today about the microbiome and the theater of activity, probably lots of peptides and metabolites released by microbiota um, uh, have different uh, um, outcome on the body. So we have to uh, uh, look at it in the complex way. And in the end, uh, we have to say that uh, most of the disorders nowadays are disorders of gut-brain interaction, and we have to take the holistic approach, and lifestyle medicine is really very nice fit into it. So starting from the very good relation with a patient and health care professional um, who can uh, advise lifestyle medicine um, um, strategies, of course, physical activity, proper nutrition, adequate amount of sleep. Um, this, will, this, this has to be uh, implemented in order to have a, a, a good uh, clinical outcome. And of course, we can use drugs, we can use neuromodulators, we can use probiotics, antibiotics, and, and also systematic treatment. So in conclusion, we have to say that microbiome modulation is possible, and already there are clinical proofs that it works. There are society guidelines, uh, for example, AGA guideline on probiotics. Uh, there is a promising data in other non-GI disorders like in cardiovascular or lung diseases. We have to be aware that there is a limited role of meta-analysis in microbiota studies. We need more large microbiome studies exploring cause and effect. We need more well-designed randomized interventional microbiome studies. And there is also a new emerging field of pharmacotherapeutics when we look at microbiome and drug interactions. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
Thank you very much, Wojciech, for your very interesting and uh, very updated <laughs> presentation. I think that it's a topic that it's not so familiar to all. So uh, we need such a presentation so that to show that this is very important for the health and also for uh, the lifestyle medicine, has to do with lifestyle medicine, as uh, you said. Okay, uh, now we'll uh, go on with the next speaker, Professor David Susta. Uh, is an associate professor in sport and exercise medicine at uh, Dublin City University in Ireland. He has been working as a clinician for the past 25, 25th uh, years with top athletes and chronic cardiometabolic patients by providing them with services such as exercise capacity assessment, cardiopulmonary function testing, pre -pre -pre participation health screening, exercise prescription and guidance for sport injuries, rehabilitation, prevention. So uh, there is a little problem with David regarding the connection. And so we can hear you. David, are you online? Yes, yes, hopefully okay. we can hear. Apologies for not being able to connect uh, using my camera. But uh, the, I, I'm still receiving messages from the system saying that my connection is unstable. Yeah. So I had to switch off my camera. Hopefully it's going to work better. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for inviting me and good morning, everybody. Uh, today I have to talk about how to increase the energy expenditure in uh, our daily activities. Actually, I'm going to talk about how to facilitate our patients in order to do so. And before uh, giving uh, some <clears throat> suggestion on, uh, actually my best suggestion on uh, how to do this, uh, I'm going to put emphasis on uh, two prerequisites that are very important uh, before uh, starting. David, uh, sorry, David, uh, uh, just to put it in bigger uh, play. So that sorry? Uh, put, uh, uh, click play so that you have the full screen of your presentation. Yes, okay. Okay. Yes. Can you see now that? Is that better? Yes, yes, it's nice. Okay, so uh, the first uh, uh, <clears throat> step before uh, starting any program, uh, exercise program or any behavioral change program is to assess uh, our patient's uh, readiness. And this is something that can be done easily and quickly by just simply asking this a question uh, you can see on the screen. And if you're a patient that tick uh, the first uh, box, the first answer, I do not intend to increase my physical activity in the next six months, is uh, <clears throat> better for, for you and for the patient to drop the idea to start any program because they are not ready and they probably need to do a few steps back in the process and uh, start again with uh, some motivational interviewing and some uh, health literacy activity so that they can be ready to change their behavior to uh, <clears throat> adopt a new kind of a lifestyle. Instead, if they tick any of the three uh, boxes at the bottom, they just need some guidance and some uh, support for them to be more effective um, uh, in uh, introducing exercise in their daily routine and for them to to set goals and, and achieve targets. The second uh, uh, prerequisite is that uh, the literature has now shown very clearly that there's no point in prescribing exercise only. Uh, diet and exercise are far more effective when uh, they are offered to our patients simultaneously. And the reason is a metabolic one. It's not only about optimizing the energy balance, you know, the energy intake from food and the energy expenditure from uh, exercise, but it's also about improving the overall metabolism in our cells. But more importantly, is about building skeletal muscle mass and reducing body fat. So uh, we have to keep in mind that these two uh, prerequisites in order to be more effective. And my first uh, uh, advice or my first suggestion to uh, improve uh, to our uh, exercise uh, program effectiveness and uh, to help our patients to uh, exercise more and increase their energy expenditure is uh, this one, setting an affordable goal and make it as simple as possible for them to achieve. Uh, the best way of uh, doing this uh, 
is uh, actually to uh, share the same language and keep the language as simple as possible. For example, using the concept of MET, which is relatively straightforward for them to understand because it's the resting metabolic rate. And then uh, you can uh, define uh, activities depending on the intensity compared to that uh, resting metabolic rate. In particular, MET minutes uh, per week uh, or per day are convenient ways of measuring both intensity and volume in one go. So it's far easier for them to understand met minutes compared to just minutes with a relatively uh, not well-defined intensity because they're not familiar. And we always ship, uh, need to keep in mind that our patients most of the time are not familiar with uh, exercising. So uh, they struggle to identify what is uh, light, what is moderate, what is vigorous intensity. And to that purpose, we can uh, help them by you know, offering them different uh, activities uh, and trying to identify, you know, the right amount of intensity and the right volume. And for example, in this slide, you can see uh, in, in green uh, that I did uh, translate uh, the current uh, World Health Organization uh, suggestion or advices to recommended amount of physical activity into uh, met minutes per week. And <clears throat> As you can see here, uh, the amount is uh, considerably different uh, depending on which uh, modality, which intensity you are going for. Uh, 40, uh, 450 uh, um, mets per minute uh, per week uh, if you go for the vigorous physical activity and uh, more or less around 750 uh, mets per minute per week. Uh, if you go for the moderate intensity. Obviously enough, it's not easy to understand that even for us as the ones prescribing exercise, which activity is actually more likely to offer a moderate intensity compared to a vigorous intensity. And to today's purpose, I would suggest to have a look at this compendium, the one you can see at the bottom of the slide. This was published many years ago and is regularly updated. In this compendium, you can find that most of the human activities are coded and classified depending on the met values. And so doing, you know, you can be more accurate in prescribing the right dose of exercise and the right modality for uh, your uh, patients. The second uh, piece uh, of advice is uh, the one you can see in this slide, which is about taking every, every opportunity. Uh, actually, our role should be empowering our patients to be able to take every opportunity, more or less everywhere they are. For example, at home, one of the strategies is uh, to reduce the sitting time, you know, as been uh, told before uh, this morning. Uh, in order to do so, you can also start doing some housework, including cleaning uh, the floor, for example. And these are activities uh, where you can, as a patient, as the one exercising, you can modulate the intensity. You can clean the floor uh, very, very quickly. So increasing the intensity, you can clean the floor, uh, you know, at very low uh, pace and so doing you are more in the area or in the range of intensity known as moderate. There are other strategies uh, that are known uh, to be effective in increasing energy expenditure. For example, wearing additional weights uh, to the upper and the lower limbs uh, or to our extremities can increase uh, the energy expenditure by 15, even 20%, depending on the weight. But this is not only about in increasing the energy exp uh, expenditure. This is also about uh, strengthening the muscles and growing over time the muscle mass, which is always uh, a, good, uh, a good outcome in our uh, programs because we know of the active role played by our muscles in uh, regulating many metabolisms. And then, as you can see here, you can change slightly your uh, schedule in order to walk the dog, for example. And walking the dog is not only uh, useful for you to exercise because you are walking the dog for a given amount of time. Uh, dogs uh, need to be walked many times a day. And this is very helpful for the patients uh, 
to embed into their daily routine some form of exercise. And as you can see, the last one is a bit of provocation, but you know, even uh, if you are a sedentary kind of person, you can uh, use uh, video games in order to increase your energy expenditure. Uh, uh, a paper published years ago by um, some of my colleagues uh, in the, the here in DCU actually show that if you play fitness uh, uh, oriented uh, video games, uh, you can actually increase uh, your energy expenditure and you can actually achieve the moderate intensity target, uh, which is good news because this is not, uh, uh, not uh, obviously mandatory. We can't prescribe video games. Now the industry of the video game industry is uh, sensitive to this uh, issue and they are now supporting us in the process of offering more opportunities to our patients. And uh, finally, you can act on uh, your, uh, your kind of environment by organizing your own gym, on rethinking your leisure time, spending more time gardening, and so on and so on. At work, you know, the, the approach has to be similar. You know, uh, standing instead of sitting is a good opportunity. Now there are people suggesting that we should use uh, desks uh, without uh, using a chair because this has been shown to be very helpful in keeping high, uh, higher than usual our metabolism. Uh, there are now apps that you can use in your laptop uh, telling you to stop uh, working in a sitting position and do some exercise. You can uh, and you should uh, prefer using stairs <coughs> instead of elevators and you can meet your colleagues uh, uh, walking instead of uh, sitting around the table and uh, at the end of the day, it's all about reorganizing your working space in order to be facilitated in this task of moving more our body and moving more our muscles. Obviously enough, it all depends on your executive in your company, but most of the time because of the pressure they have on the so-called social responsibility, some of the corporate fitness program can allow for these changes to happen inside your working space. And another example is, is, uh, is uh, given at the bottom of this uh, slide, science uh, to encourage uh, active choices. For example, science uh, uh, position close to the elevator and showing where the stairs are actually increase uh, the use of stairs uh, by uh, many employees. And obviously, uh, if you seek support from your colleagues, uh, uh, you are more likely to maintain uh, these behavioral changes over time. Uh, this is very important. And by the way, there are, uh, there are now competition between uh, big uh, companies. Uh, and this is another way of promoting uh, 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 health uh, via promoting uh, exercise participation among employees in large companies. But in between home and work, there's also a time that shouldn't be wasted in order to increase the energy expenditure. For example, we can commute using human power vehicles and bicycles by definition, but also a walking is a, is a very good is a very good way of commuting if you live uh, in a relatively affordable range of distances from your workplace. Uh, another strategy could be that you can park your car farther away than, than the usual uh, uh, car park and from your workplace so that you're going to increase uh, the number of steps per day. And uh, if you walk, uh, if you walk more, you shouldn't walk just uh, at a, a self-selected uh, pace because usually this is not exactly what we are aiming at. And we have to change our patients' mindset. We have to offer them a target even in, when they walk. And now we know, thanks to many studies, uh, but especially one that has been published recently, that uh, we have to uh, keep a step frequency more or less of 100 steps per minute in order to achieve the moderate intensity target and a frequency, step frequency of more or less 120 steps per minute in order to achieve a vigorous uh, intensity. And finally, uh, if you use the public transport, uh, you have to use it with a different attitude. 
keeping in mind that bus stops, uh, for example, were designed to cover uh, the, the, the city uh, and to give uh, citizens an opportunity to uh, use a good service, not a, a poor service. So the, they are relatively uh, manageable in terms of, of uh, distance that you can cover from one bus, uh, bus stop to the next uh, one. And I'm going to show you a very interesting kind of public health initiative that was done years ago in London, where uh, the, the tube map was actually recycled by offering the citizen an alternative way of moving from one station to the next one. And as you can see, all of these small numbers are there to show the time you need to walk from one station to the next one. And this is again, especially in pandemic times, very useful for our uh, patients to embed into their daily life routines uh, some exercise, but it's also useful for other people to be more aware of the fact that sometimes you take uh, the public transport just for, uh, uh, to, just to cover a distance that is absolutely uh, walkable distance. So instead of going for the public transport, we should go always uh, or we should advise our patients to go always for this uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, activity. And uh, finally, probably the most important of all uh, the, the advice is that we have to be ready to empower our uh, uh, patients to interrupt uh, prolonged muscular resting. Uh, this is probably the key factor in uh, making them healthier and uh, more active. We moved uh, over the years uh, from uh, a very demanding uh, kind of uh, uh, exercise program in this uh, particular case, you know, there was a three minute uh, fast uh, walking uh, uh, followed by three minutes uh, slow walking for 300 minutes uh, uh, a week uh, and for four months. It was effective, but it was not affordable for our uh, patients. So we moved towards a more affordable kind of uh, time management and time allocation to exercise. And in this paper, for example, it was uh, shown that uh, calisthenics, uh, just five exercises uh, uh, lasting 100 20 seconds every hour, so two minutes every hour for the full uh, working day was enough to increase energy expenditure uh, and uh, provide some uh, benef benefit to, uh, our, <clears throat> to, to our bodies. And finally, please. yes, no, I'm about to finish, no, no problem. Uh, so, the, and finally, uh, the kind of magic bullet, as they say in this uh, systematic review, uh, which is known as the high, intermit uh, high intensity intermittent uh, training or intermittent exercise, which has been shown to be uh, more effective than continuous exercise by 30% more effective uh, than a continuous exercise in uh, reducing uh, body fat. So, uh, uh, my last uh, slide uh, is actually uh, a bit of a provocation based on a very interesting, uh, still uh, relatively uh, um, interesting, I mean, uh, interesting and uh, uh, relatively uh, challenging way of exercising. Uh, this is a, a paper published a, a few uh, months ago, if I remember correctly, it was published in March 2000. Uh, 2020, something like that. Um, and their approach was asking people to exercise for only four seconds every hour. So, uh, so that over, over the day, there were only 160 seconds uh, of exercise. The intensity was very high. Uh, the perception of incentives was also very high, but the good news is that uh, this kind of approach, uh, while uh, sitting for eight hours, uh, was enough to reduce a postprandial uh, plasma triglyceride by 31%, and was also good at elevating fat oxidation. So, in other words, it was good enough to improve uh, the overall efficiency of the aerobic uh, metabolic uh, meal. 
uh, by an average of 43%. So the bottom line and my take home message is that we just need to forget all the gadgets, all the frills, all the expensive uh, devices, uh, all the expensive equipments, the apps and so on. And we just need to move our muscles. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, David, for your presentation and the useful tips you gave to us. So uh, we'll have some time in the end to discuss. Next uh, speaker is Professor Mikhail Kulescu from Romania. He's the head of gastroenterology department, Carol Davila University in Bucharest. So, Professor Kulescu, you have. Hello, everybody. Do you see my screen? Yes. I'll make my full screen. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, uh, <laughs> the organizer, for inviting me to have this speech and uh, congratulations because I see that even it is Saturday, we have more than 160 attenders. And also, I would like to, to thank a lot, Professor Arkadianos, for leaving me the, this position because almost everybody has spoken, easing my task. Uh, even uh, the very, very interesting uh, sp speak of Professor Marlix um, from Poland, uh, uh, the, the influence of microbiota on fatty liver disease might be very important and you can manipulate the mi microbiota in favor of uh, treating fatty liver disease. Uh, my, uh, three, um, my three enemies in uh, our days in fighting against uh, fatty liver disease is the TV, the COVID uh, pandemics, and alcohol consumptions. And I will explain you uh, a little bit why are those uh, problems. Uh, in my country, nobody drinks alcohol. Everybody drinks only their plum brandy, which is containing no alcohol, and their uh, grapes from the vineyards, which make wine, which has no supplementary alcohol. I'm joking because uh, it is very, very difficult to, um, uh, to have somebody to be very sincere about alcohol consumption. So we have to define very clearly what is this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The TV is sending very bad, um, very bad um, uh, habit, uh, habits, uh, messy is uh, uh, eating chips and uh, our, uh, our uh, uh, football player Haji uh, is uh, drinking beer and uh, everybody is staying at the uh, TV set uh, looking to sports. So there are bad habits on the TV as one of my uh, other, pen the other panelists have shown us. So to be, uh, to be very short in my speech, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease means many diseases. First, in first place is the hepatic steatosis, which is very, very frequent. Uh, steatohepatitis, which might be inflammation, and then comes fibrosis, and finally cirrhosis. It is a very uh, high prevalence in Europe, as in the United States of America, more than 23%, but if we have also um, uh, diabetes 2, uh, the percentages are going higher up to more than 60% in Europe. So it's a problem, in, especially if you have comorbidities. It's a multi-system disorder, which includes hypertension, uh, myositis dysfunction of the heart, uh, insulin resistance, uh, um, fasting glucose, uh, um, beta cell dysfunctions, inflammation, uh, and also uh, kidney injuries. The economic burden of NASH is very, very important. Uh, more than 600,000 cases of advanced NASH in the United States of America and lifetime direct course may be more than 200 billions of uh, United States dollars. The epidemiology, we, we um, uh, make parts from uh, ages. Even in childhood, there might be uh, non-alcoholic left fat liver disease, but the large amount, uh, up to 30% of the population, adult population might have um, fatty liver disease. You see, severe obesity and type 2 diabetes might uh, have um, uh, almost all of them, more than 70% uh, non alcoholic fatty liver disease. The progression um, is uh, important because when you have cumulative risk factors, you go from simple hepatic steatosis to 
uh, start to hepatitis, which means inflammation, and then in a few years you may uh, go to uh, cirrhosis, which can lead to decompensated cirrhosis of hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, which is a, a very, very bad condition. So somewhere around 30% of the adult population might go to um, decompensated liver cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma, which is a, a very bad news. We know what metabolic syndrome is. I wouldn't insist on this slide. And the risk factors um, are uh, uh, very important. Abdominal obesity, insulin resistant, type 2 diabetes, hypertrigliceridemia, older age, and hypertension. And uh, lifestyle risk factors are important. Physical inactivity, calorie excess, weight gain, and carbohydrate rich, rich in sugar and high fat diets. So lifestyle management is very important. Weight loss is very important. You have to use your energy stores and so reduce your visceral adipose tissue mass to decrease the fatty acid delivery and uptake and reduce uh, peripheral and hepatic insulin resistance. So you will increase beta oxidation and reduce intrahepatic triglycerides. Weight loss must be significant. Only a uh, thin uh, weight loss should not influence fatty liver disease. You have to lose a lot of weight, somewhere around 7 to 10% of your body weight in order to um, have the, uh, the chance of reducing your fatty liver disease. So the caloric goals are based on the initial body weight, and you see it's different if you are under 113 kilograms and you have over 113 kilograms. The recommended uh, lifestyle intervention for patients who have uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is the weight loss I have told you, the dietary restriction of calories of more than five to 1,000 kilocalories per day, Low carbohydrate day is very important to replace the calories with uh, uh, polyunsaturated uh, uh, fatty acids or uh, monounsaturated uh, fatty acids um, to consume zero calorie beverages, but um, uh, some of those zero calorie beverages are increasing your, um, uh, your uh, appetite and also uh, increase physical activity. It was uh, already told in uh, other, um, uh, other uh, speaks uh, today. Physical activities is very important. Uh, it can uh, enhance insulin sensitivity, reduce the progression to type 2 diabetes, maintain weight loss, reduce visceral fat, improve cardiac output, and be favorable to modify the lipid profile. So this is uh, very important, and you see that uh, you have uh, uh, listened to many ways of uh, having a physical activity. Aerobic um, versus resistant training. Aerobic is of choice, more than three times per week, more than 30 minutes per session, which will improve metabolic parameters associated with non-alcoholic liver, liver disease and reduces the risk of progression of non-alcoholic liver disease and also hepatic triglycerides. But also resistant training might be useful, but uh, we are insisting on aerobic. It is important the intensity and duration, and you have seen in the uh, previous speech that even a um, uh, very short time, but high intensity might be useful, and the duration you have, uh, you have already understood from my previous speakers. Nutritional medical therapy uh, could um, in, uh, include fructose sweetened beverages, um, in order to, to, um, uh, to replace some 25% of the energy uh, requirements and the low carbohydrate date, which might be very, very important. You see uh, calorie restriction diet, diet and carbohydrate uh, restriction diet might induce a 4% weight loss. Low fat diets is very important. So even if you are um, uh, uh, having a normal uh, uh, it is a caloric diet. If you have a uh, high fat, is a caloric diet which can increase liver fat. So um, it is important uh, the total fat intake and the um, total calorie intake. Weight loss is the cornerstone of um, reducing fatty liver disease. The Mediterranean diet, you already know it, is very beneficial. 
uh, the components of the Mediterranean diet, I wouldn't insist, everybody knows it. Um, you have to avoid monounsaturated fatty acids because um, they will increase inflammatory effects, will increase hepatic steatosis and insulin resistance. And you see uh, decreasing total fat and uh, uh, carbohydrates might improve your, uh, your uh, liver uh, function. If you uh, have a diet in low saturated fat, uh, you will increase uh, uh, your uh, NASH uh, activity. Uh, so you have to use um, more, uh, uh, more omega-3 than omega-6 uh, polyunsaturated fat. So this is also one important uh, topic. And uh, other uh, dietary uh, factors that impact uh, non-alcoholic effect of liver disease is alcohol. I have made this joke in my, uh, uh, in my uh, um, uh, words of uh, beginning uh, because alcohol might be very important. Uh, if you have an advanced NASH or liver cirrhosis, you have to have complete abstinence. But as you have seen from my previous speakers, alcohol contains calories and induce um, uh, uh, increase in appetite. So you'll eat more calories if you are drinking alcohol. So um, the advice is not to uh, use alcohol, even if it's a very pure wine or a very pure Trika, the uh, Romanian plum brandy. Coffee might be important also for fatty liver disease, uh, but it doesn't be, appear to correlate to amount of caffeine, and also uh, it is uh, considered a reasonable adjunct to patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Vitamin E, even if it can lead to histological improvement on long term, it may increase all causes of mortality and the risk of to develop prostate cancer. The behavior activity is also very important and uh, the weight loss um, might be dependent also of uh, the emotion, thoughts and diets. In conclusion, um, ladies and gentlemen, weight loss, physical activities and dietary changes should be implemented on a long-term basis on all patients with non-alcohol liver disease, but especially in patients with um, uh, steatohepatitis because I consider we consider that Steatohepatitis is the moment when things can move towards fibrosis, liver cirrhosis, and then the compensated liver cirrhosis and, um, and uh, hepatocarcinoma. The Mediterranean day, uh, diet, even if you um, are uh, uh, calling it um, in other terms, uh, the principles are quite the same. Um, it's a healthy eating model that has been shown to improve cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, and NFLD. And the multidisciplinary approach where physicians work together um, with uh, trainers, uh, with uh, um, dietitians, psychologists, exercise physiologists, and so on and so forth, in order to uh, improve um, alcohol fatty liver disease on a long-term uh, base. Thank you for your attention, and I'm uh, uh, looking forward for your questions. Thank you very uh, much, Professor De Gulescu. Very, very nice. Your presentation was useful, was uh, interesting, and I think that we'll have questions if, uh, from the audience. So I would like to thank all of you. You were all on, on time. That was very, very good for the uh, program of the Congress, of the uh, Congress. And I think that we have a couple of questions from the audience, just to see. The one is from Dr. Marlitz. How long we have to use probiotics before we can see measurable changes in health? It's from George Sakas, it's from Greece, as I know. Boshe, can you hear us? I'm not sure that's in online. No, Vasek, are you uh, well, uh, if, if you wish, I can, uh, I can okay. give an answer because yes, I'm because guessing because this too. Can, can you, can you? Yes, yes. yes. Um, so, uh, uh, influence microbiota is very important, but you have to, uh, to push for a rather long period of time, at least one month, in my opinion. Three months will be better. But it depends what uh, is your target. Uh, you can influence microbiota um, uh, towards uh, influencing in irritable bowel syndrome, or maybe sometimes you can hope 
to stabilize an inflammatory bowel disease. So you have for a long uh, for a long track to take to take those probiotics. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to make in, uh, my, in my yeah. opinion too, we have to we have to recommend it for two three months yeah. uh, until the, uh, and it depends also on the grade of the dysbiosis because uh, if we are doing the test uh, microbiota test we will receive a report of the, the, the dysbiosis. And if the dysbiosis is very, very high, 17 or 16, then we have to, uh, to take this uh, probiotics uh, for a longer time. Um, another thing that I would like to underline about the uh, microbiota is that uh, during uh, COVID, uh, it is uh, described uh, dysbiosis with a lower uh, bifidobacterium and lactobacillus. So uh, the treatment uh, with probiotics should be uh, considered also in COVID. Okay, thank you. Professor Dikulescu, another question for you. What's yep. your opinion regarding uh, non-alcoholic fatty fat disease and very low carb ketogenic diet and or antioxidant supplementation? It's from Greece again, from Manolis Maravagiotakis, from Crete. So, so very low uh, uh, calorie intake, I understand. This is uh, yes, the question. And, uh, uh, and ketogenic diet. Ketogenic diet. Well, uh, my answer is um, a, little bit, uh, um, a little bit philosophical. I think that God has invented men to be, um, uh, to be omnivore. So you have to eat uh, almost all things, not to be very, very um, concentrated of one uh, one type of uh, of diet, only be vegetarian or only be uh, using uh, um, using only uh, proteins or so on and so forth. So you have to be very careful because a very severe diet can induce um, very um, very complex disease. We know from the history of mankind that uh, um, having a, a restrictive diet on the uh, boats who were across the Atlantic have uh, uh, proven uh, the existence of um, uh, of, score, um, of vitamin C deficiency. Mm -hmm. um, also, berry berries when you eat only uh, uh, rice and uh, if you eat only only maize, you can have uh, pellagra. So, uh, restrictive diets. I don't recommend these restrictive diets. Mm -hmm. even uh, for uh, fatty liver disease. And uh, what about using L-carnitine of uh, beta-oxidation and enhancement uh, from Alina Pascu from Ania Baby? Um, I really don't have enough information for, uh, for this, uh, uh, for this towards uh, um, um, uh, the, the effect on um, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I don't have enough information. Okay. Um, uh, do you recommend? I have another question. Do, uh, from another for professor. Do you recommend a certain type of probiotic? If so, which do you recommend? It's from you or from Dr. Bosiek, but it's not here. Yes. Uh, um, I don't recommend only one type of probiotics. I usually recommend several, uh, um, several probiotics, which I have uh, confidence in them, and which have been proved in real life to be uh, effective. And I use uh, some 10 days to one month, one probiotic, and then change the probiotics, because diversity is the principle. Uh, I use uh, very frequently Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, especially in people who have uh, a form of uh, irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea, for instance, because it might induce constipation. Also, um, uh, um, also um, Bifidobacterium longum or Lactobacillus plantarium. Uh, so I change them every 10 days or every month for three months. It is like uh, Anka Hunku has also uh, told two, three months is uh, the, the lapse of time, the, let's say, minimum lapse of time in which you can, um, uh, you can relay on obtaining uh, uh, a resolution of symptoms and a control of the disease. Uh -huh. uh, so Yanis, Yanis, please. 
there are also questions in the yes, chat. Yes, from Reka. Yes, okay, a question to Reka. Uh, it's from Carlos Van uh, uh, Medium. Uh, I have seen severe oxygen the saturation in people who come from a cardiac checkup and to do exercise test with face mask. So with face mask. What's your opinion? Your comment? Unmute myself. So I have found only very few studies about wearing face masks during exercise. And I think it just needs more study and uh, more data about exercise and wearing face masks. I think there's difference between the face masks. So yeah, probably, but uh, I could only uh, draw these data from the literature so far. So we'll, we'll see. I think it uh, it's needs to be more studied. Uh, it's a, a question for uh, Abdul Javar Trusco. Is intermittent fasting recommended for diabetics? I can answer. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, data that it helps, but to my point of view, you can make something that you can support long term. Uh, how long can you support an intermittent fasting diet? You know, maybe you have to see a model that it's more easy to follow. Mediterranean diet is a very good model with a lot of uh, bibliography and also uh, helps in all this to, to control diabetes and cardiovascular disease. I have also a question for Professor Niculescu. Uh, if uh, PESCO Mediterranean diet with intermittent fasting which is a new article in uh, appear. Uh, if you consider, could be recommended in uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I think that we can recommend it. It is uh, an inter interesting way of um, of providing the pa the patient with some solution because unfortunately we don't have many medication in fatty liver disease who has been proven to uh, to improve uh, the. Uh, the inflammation or uh, to improve um, uh, the the content of um, of fat in the liver. So I think this is it might be a solution. And uh, for you, Professor, one question regarding probiotics: Can you take it for a long term, or you have to stop it for a while and come back? Is it safe to take it for one year, two years, for example? I don't think it is necessary. I think that uh, those probiotics, you see, we have 100,000 billions of um, uh, millions of uh, uh, microorganisms in our colon. And giving one, um, two, or three probiotics will not um, uh, uh, make uh, the difference. But those probiotics should influence uh, the, those, um, uh, those uh, microbi microbes in the microbiome of the person. So I don't think that using it for two, three years would make the difference. Two, three months will be all right and then make some pauses, some holidays. I've seen, um, I was looking at some questions and somebody asked me if uh, some uh, natural probiotics from yogurt, from kefir, from uh, sauerkraut would uh, be uh, useful also. I think, yes, when I finish with the influence of the uh, branded probiotics, I recommend the patient to use um, in um, every day another type of uh, natural probiotics. So one day yogurt, another day kefir, another day uh, um, uh, other uh, produce, uh, other products, um, maybe dairy products which are fermented with something different, and so they will diversify naturally their microbiota. So this is the second phase of my recommendation to use natural probiotics from those. But you have to see uh, how um, you can uh, tolerate because some. Some people are not tolerating the lactose, others uh, the fibers from the uh, from the cabbage. So uh, you have to to take into consideration the uh, the personal um, uh, intestinal uh, sensitivity. Okay, I have uh, uh, from Professor Susta, David. David, did did you show the last recommendation? I think that it uh, it was. Uh, Yesterday, that uh, World Health Organization 
release. I, I didn't understand your question at the very beginning. I think I, I think that uh, two days before the World Health Organization uh, announced the new uh, 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 the new uh, physical activity recommendations. Have you any uh, update? Do you have something to uh, to comment? It's very it's very new. I, I saw it in the news. Uh, no, I couldn't have a look at the new recommendation. I was actually waiting for them uh, because as you as you probably noticed from my presentation now we we should move uh, to a more affordable way of exercising by reducing the exercise time and by increasing the recovery time. If you ask uh, your patient to exercise uh, five times a day for at least thirty minutes uh, usually most of them are not ready and are not able to to do this and for this reason they can fail and they can be frustrated and they can drop and they can stop exercising you know drop the program and stop exercising so they are likely to move back to their their original risk factors profile so it must be more more realistic with what we recommend to our patients that to be Easy yes to follow yes. yes that's the meaning that's a message yeah to. yeah but more realistic but also uh we have to support them uh, according to their needs not uh, uh, only according to our uh, recommendation our rules and uh, and uh, everything we know from science and we have to adapt uh, our scientific knowledge to their needs which is what is actually challenging in many chronic uh, patients I see one question here from Alexandra de Toledo, knowing that most of the animal products, meat, dairy, eggs, are full of saturated fats, hormones, toxins. Should we promote a vegan diet? It's a big discussion, Alexandra. <laughs> I think that you have to make a special section for it because there are a lot of options. I don't know if the other panelists have to do so, to say something, but or Stefania, what did you? Maybe, uh, Ioannis, if you allow me, I can uh, share with you the guidelines that you mentioned. It's okay? Okay, I think that, yes, I would, I asked to Professor Susta the, if it has uh, read it, I think that you can. Here it is, uh, 150 to 30 minutes of uh, moderate intensity activity. Mm. Okay, increase, I think. Eh? I, I, I think that degrees it. So it increased? Yes, it degrees. David, it degrees then. It increased. Yes, I don't think it's uh, so if easy. I can, it's not about increasing the time only. It's a, the, the, the key factor here is uh, the interplay between intensity and volume right so this is what really matters so you can uh, the, the point of my presentation was actually to highlight that you can achieve some metabolic benefits by exercising only for a few seconds literally few seconds every hour and you can change uh, your metabolic profile by doing this uh, a similar uh, effect has been proven to be associated with a, a far more demanding uh, pattern of exercising. For example, mm -hmm. uh, 30 minutes a day. And uh, it, it, this is not only about aerobic exercises. This is about uh, stimulating the muscles, the skeletal muscles, the proper way for them to adapt and to bring some benefit to the whole of the body. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that we are uh, ready to finish because it's time for a small break and to prepare for the next session. I would like to thank all of you because it was a very interesting session, a lot of questions and debate. Uh, and I think that uh, in the next uh, Congress, maybe I hope in Athens, I say it was to be these days, but due to the COVID, uh, it was not possible to organize it live. But next years, I hope due to the vaccines and all the, the good news, that we'll have uh, may, uh, the opportunity to have it here in Athens, the live conference of uh, Elmo. So, Ivan, do you have anything to? 
Um, no, thank you for everybody who did <laughs> so great presentation in such a short time. And uh, just for organization, uh, because I see many people raised hands, so please um, send the questions. We try to reply to all of them, uh, but just send in, in advance uh, because it's easier for us to manage and uh, this is what is possible today. But anyway, thank you for uh, uh, all the, the specialists, the experts who uh, contributed, made possible the nutrition and physical activity chapter. And we will take a five minutes break so everybody can do I mean, as uh, Davide was recommending to, to do some physical activity, to yes, do some need, breath, some <laughs> something. So, and then we, um, we come back in, uh, in five minutes. So thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Keep safe. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.